we have on our stage today the master of merriment and mirth, the maestro of music and magic, the man of flim flam, the lady of laughs. Let's give a warm Oldsville welcome to Professor Farquhar and Polk Cat Annie. started I want to announce this because I'm very proud of this fact. The show you're about to see, we are now in our 30th season and we've traveled all over the United States. We are based in Missouri and uh, I'm curious how many of you are seeing our show for the first time? Raise your hand. How many of you are seeing our show for the last time? Raise your hand. <laughs> I just want to get the cards on the table. In just a moment, you're going to be exposed to music and magic performed with unparalleled mediocrity. You will see the act that was banned in Boston, condemned in Cleveland, banished from Baltimore, booed in Bolivia, panned in Panama, declared taboo in Kathmandu, but somehow has found wide acceptance throughout Missouri. It all starts like this.
Down the 
was written in, uh, by a fellow named Billy Deshade and first appeared in print in June of 1882 in the St. Joseph Gazette, St. Joseph, Missouri, which was just two months after Jesse James had been shot in the back by a member of his own gang. Now, over here on my right is my sidekick, my partner, my best friend, my wife, the lady I like to call the little woman. Please welcome the amazing Paul Cat Annie. Annie and I have been together now for 47 years. We've traveled all over the United States. We've played in circuses. We've been with carnivals. We've been in theaters. Ambassador. But they like the truth for once. What? He likes to exaggerate just a bit. I'm just. I, I'm just not. I'm, I'm embellishing. Oh, we've been all those places and we've done all those things, but it didn't take me 47 years. Tell them the truth. The truth. The truth. The truth. The truth is, Polecat Annie and I have been together for what seems like 47 years now. <laughs> when, I, when I first met her, she was working for Ringling Brothers Circus as a human cannonball. It's true. First time I laid eyes on her, I could tell here's a woman of high caliber. <laughs> She's going to play a little thing here called a limberjack. This is an old Appalachian folk toy that migrated to the Ozarks over a hundred years ago. All she has to do is tap out a rhythm on that pedal and that puppet will syncopate anything she does without the use of batteries or microchips. It's, it's 19th century technology at its very best. I'm going to put him to work with a, a medley of songs that were written by America's first great songwriter, Stephen Foster. Back in the 1850s and 1860s, he wrote more than 200 songs, and we're still singing a lot of them. We no more my lady, woo Weep no more today. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky home, for the old Kentucky home, follow we. Thank you. 
then that limb gave away and they both came a tumbling down. And when that preacher began to pray, he could give it four miles around. Sasper. 
Africa. It actually was the root of the, the sarsaparilla plant from South America. This also had juniper and mandrake and wintergreen. And also it was about 60% alcohol. Made you glad you felt bad. <laughs> this is Hamlin's wizard oil. John Hamlin started out during the Civil War as a 21-year-old man going from army camp to army camp with his wizard oil. It was a liniment that you could drink, too. It was 70% alcohol. Yeah. Now, now, here's one that you ladies would have liked if you when you were raising children. Very popular back in the 1880s. This is Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup for teething toddlers. All you had to do when your baby was upset with teething is just take some of this and put it on a cotton swab and, and swab the baby's gums. And the pain would go away immediately. And not only that, the baby would sleep through the night peacefully. And guess what the secret ingredient was? Morphine. that's still around, you probably have all tried at least once. It was invented in 1886 by a pharmacist in Waco, Texas. He invented this thing he called a blood purifier. And he named it after his neighbor, whose name was, his neighbor was a, a physician down there. His name was Dr. Pepper. They called it Dr. Pepper's tonic. They claimed it would give you get up and go. They didn't tell you the secret ingredient was prune juice. <laughs> I'm going to show you some of the magic you might have experienced at a medicine show back in the 1800s. Simple stuff, not like the big um, illusions you see on stage in Vegas anymore. This is genuine silk, hand knitted by a worm. You ever heard of silkworms? They come from China. They're not really worms, they're caterpillars. They make silk cocoons. Chinese people unravel those cocoons to make silk cloth. You didn't want to hear about that, I know. You know, back in the 1800s, people were so amazed with a simple trick like this, they forgot to applaud. <laughs> this is genuine silk, hand-knitted by a worm. Thank you. Thank you very little. All right, this silk goes right into my hand. Notice my hand never leaves my wrist. Stick it in there, give it. Give it a magic pass, blow on it, like that. That sucker's gone, it's out of here. I'm gonna check here. And check the watch. How are we doing on Oh, we're doing fine on time. You see my watch? Can you see that watch? I'm very proud of that watch. My, my grandfather, on his deathbed, sold me this watch. <laughs> I gave him a check. <laughs> My grandmother was a full-blooded Asatati Indian from the Black Hills of South Dakota. And when my grandfather passed away, she wanted to return to the Indian reservation where she was born and raised. So I took her. And I lived with her on that reservation for three years. And I learned everything I could about my grandmother's people, the Asatati Indians. I learned their language, their customs, their traditions, and I learned secrets for the medicine man. His name was Pahu. He taught me how to heal with the use of herbs. And he taught me a ritual. So what I'm going to show you is an authentic Indian medicine man ritual that's been performed for more than 200 years. Now, oftentimes in my audiences, there are children, and I, I couldn't see if there are any kids here, but if there are, I want you to raise your hand right now and repeat after me. I promise, I, promise. I will never, I will ever, ever, ever attempt this ritual at home because I know my mother hates bloody kitchen knives. <laughs> By the way, how many of you folks have heard of the Asatana Indians from the Black Hills of South Dakota? They're better known as the Brownfoot Indians. How many of you have heard of the Brownfoot? How many of you have heard of the Blackfoot Indians? Yes. How many of you have heard of Indians? Yes. 
The Blackfoot Indians lived in North Dakota. The Brownfoot Indians lived in South Dakota. The Blackfoot Indians rode horses. The Brownfoot Indians were afraid of horses and walked behind them. Now, medicine men perform rituals like this to prove to the people in their tribe that they had magical power nobody else in the tribe had. There was one famous medicine man who could walk across fire. His tribe was so impressed they made him their chief, and he went on to great glory as the man who won the Battle of the Greasy Grass, the one-year history books called Little Bighorn. His name was Sitting Bull. You've probably heard that name. Now, when a medicine man performs a ritual like this, the Indians will respond in one of two ways. They'll either get sick like this lady over here is about to do, or they hoop and holler and applaud and show him their appreciation for his great magical power. Thank you very much. Would you like to learn how to do a magic trick? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you would. I do this as a public service because uh, after a show, people come up to me and say, oh, professor, just teach me one little trick, just one little trick. And I, I get this, I get kids, of course. I get scout leaders and 4-H leaders and youth leaders from churches, and I get grandfathers. I'm a grandfather myself. I can identify with that. I'm going to teach you all a plain, a simple trick, and all you need is a plain paper bag. Hold on. Just plain paper bag. You probably have these at home in a drawer somewhere. You buy something at the store, you bring it home, and you, you can't bear to throw that bag away. You know you're going to have a use for it sometime. Inside every paper bag like this is a free prize. An invisible wall. Could I have could I have the lights up, please? So I can see the audience. This gentleman right, right here, would you stand up in the aisle? The gentleman in the front yellow. That's fine. I'm gonna reach into the bag, I'm gonna pull out an invisible ball. I want you to catch it. Then toss it back to me underhanded. Get it? Got it? Good. Catch the ball. Ready? Okay. All right. Now throw it underhanded right into the back. Good job. Give him a big round of applause. Don, I want you to do it too. Catch I'm going to get over here. Catch the ball. All right. Now throw it underhanded right into the bag. There! Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> now this is a real easy trick, and if you have grandkids or children, they're going to love learning how to do this. All you have to do is hold the bag like this with your thumb on the outside, your fingers on the inside. If you can snap your fingers, that's how you get the sound from the bag. Listen. Yeah. At the same time you're snapping, drop your hand just slightly so it looks like the ball's going in there. If you practice by yourself, it's going to look like this. See? It looks like a ball's going in there, doesn't it? It sounds like a ball's going in there. Yeah. You know what? what's funny? You do it with these kids. If you do this with kids, they're going to start to believe that you own an invisible ball. And they're going to believe that you have magical power. Use this to your advantage. 
And don't be surprised if you hear one of them say, I can say it. I can see the ball. And if it says that, you just reach in and pull out. And it does not work. I'm going to show you one more trick you can do with the same plain paper bag. I've got my bottle here. The bottle goes into the bag. You see that? I'm going to make this bottle vanish before your very eyes. And I want you to help me out here. I'm going to teach you magic words in Latin. And I want to hear all of you repeat after me in Latin and say, Nimbo cumulus. Corpus delecta. Habeas corpus. Corpus Christi. E pluribus unum. Semper fidelis. Et tu brute. Carpe burrito. Ad nauseum. You did it. It's gone. See?
Take that card. Don't let me see it. Show it to the audience, but don't show it to me. Alright? Now, don't anybody shout out the name of that card. I'm going to try to figure it out for myself. Put it right there on top, if you would. I'm going to cover it with these cards. I'm going to hand you the whole deck. Would you hold them like this? One thumb, two fingers. Step over here. Let's do this. Okay. One thumb, two fingers on each side. That's right. Okay. How many of you folks saw the card that Ken selected? What I'm going to attempt to do now is to choose the same card that he chose using a process called psychic reception. In other words, I'm going to try to read your mind. So everybody concentrate on that one card. Just concentrate on that one card. Alright, I think I know which one it is. Are you ready for me to make the choice? Yes, I am. Alright. I'm not liking where you're going with this. Ken, do you have firm bladder control? <laughs> well, we'll soon find out. <laughs> Aren't you glad you wore your brown pants today? <laughs> now, before I go through this, I always tell Ken, don't ever try this. Don't always regard any gun in your home as a loaded weapon. It's not a toy. This is not a toy. This is a real gun. It's a reproduction of a pistol that was invented in 1848 by the J.H. Derringer Company. It was a gun exactly like this one that killed Abraham Lincoln. Today, these reproductions are manufactured in Italy by the Venus de Milo Small Arms Company. <laughs>